So to me, that's the Fed's worst nightmare. I don't think they want to get to that point where you have a recession with rates rising. I think there is very little chance. I think we've been saying that they're going to be done. Uh, they're going to have to pivot by the end of 3Q. We've been saying that for, I think, a couple of months now. And after the last two weeks, I would take way under on the end of 3Q22 when the Fed starts to pivot, whether that's a pause, whether that's well, however that looks, that pivot looks. But there's just what you're seeing in the credit markets, whether you look at the treasury market, the mortgage market, the high yield market, um, foreign sovereign markets, the Bank of Japan, European, they're all having the same problem. We're seeing you know, at the sovereign level problems. We're seeing the sovereign debt crisis, the, the bursting sovereign debt bubble we've been talking about forever. It's playing out right now. And I think that's going to force them to pivot much sooner than, than most people think. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. The last time today's guest was on the program, he made the case that the world's largest nations, burdened by over $200 trillion worth of debt, better, quote, get busy inflating or get busy defaulting. Since then, many of these countries have tightened their monetary policies. Does that mean a cascade of defaults lies ahead? To find out, we welcome back macro analyst Luke Groman to the program. We'll also talk about his outlook for the markets, the US dollar, gold and oil, as well as the odds for a coming recession. Luke, thanks so much for joining us again today. Thanks for having me back on, Adam. It's great to be here. Well, Luke, uh, pleasure to have you back on. And we got a lot to dig into here. Um, lots happened since you were on the program last. Um, before we get into the weeds, though, if we could just start at a high level with a question I like to ask you every time you're on the program. What is your current assessment of today's global economy and financial markets? I think it's weak, weakening on the margin, uh, and I think it's going to keep getting weaker uh, until uh, the Fed relents. Ultimately, uh, we had a situation where uh, once you get debt to GDP as high as it is, uh, once you get uh, deficits as high as they are as a percent of GDP in the U.S., uh, going back at least 50 years, the Fed had never tried to tighten with debt to GDP over 120 percent and deficits to GDP uh, where they started uh, 4Q21, which was 12 uh, percent of GDP. They actually got them down to, on a uh, temporary basis, I think, 6 to 7 percent of GDP. Uh, it's never been tried before. Our case all along was, look, they can try it, but if they don't normalize debt to GDP to approximately 70 to 80 uh, percent before tightening, they're going to start breaking a lot of things. And they tried and they're breaking a lot of things. And so I think we are right now in a moment in time where it's it's getting more obvious that the economy is weakening on the margin. The global economy is weakening on the margin. We have a bit of a stagflationary problem with uh, energy prices uh, as well. Uh, I think it's going to get very, very obvious that the economy is much weaker than expected over the next uh, two to three months. And then we'll see where we go from there. All right. All right. I want to dig into all of that. Um, so we've got the Fed and under other central banks now tightening um, as the economy is slowing. Um, sounds like you don't really believe Jerome Powell that much when he stares in the camera at his press conferences and says that the U.S. economy is, quote, very strong and uh, has absolutely no vulnerability to a recession. Um, I don't know if he's still using those lines, but he was using them as recently as last month. Um, so I guess the question I have for you here is, you know, for a couple of months in this program, I've said kind of the big question that we need to to find out the answer to here, that's probably going to have the most uh, uh, most influence over our, our destiny from here is how much backbone the central banks have, and I'm, I'm mostly thinking about Jerome Powell and the Fed, uh, to continue tightening along their announced course here. So um, I guess my question for you is: is how high do you think rates could go here? Could uh, will they go as high as the Fed is is guiding us towards? A lot of people think no way. The Fed is just talking a big game here. It's going to pivot long before it can't stand. You know the 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 pain that it's it's causing here. But there are other voices saying no. I think the Fed's going to tighten a lot longer than most people expect. What do you think? I think there's no way they tighten very long, very much longer. Uh, and a reason I think that is. Uh, 
the factors that most in the mainstream still aren't watching, which is the U.S. balance sheet and really the U.S. income statement, the the deficit, uh, the deficit as a percent of GDP. Um, and when you look at those numbers, the debt to GDP, they are what they are. They're too high. That can go on for a period of time. But really, uh, the issue is uh, the the income statement, right? So the U.S. is spending 70% of tax receipts roughly on um, uh, entitlement pagos. So that's Social Security Administration, Health and Human Services. Uh, they're spending another, call it 25% of tax receipts on treasury spending, which is interest and in some of the stimulus, et cetera. That number, in fairness, could come down post-COVID. We'll see. It has come down a little bit. Um, but it's running at a, at a trillion dollar, roughly a trillion dollar uh, uh, annual rate still. Uh, defense is another $800 billion. I don't think that number is coming down given what's going on in uh, Russia and elsewhere around the world. So when you add those three up, those what I call the big three U.S. government expenditures are about 110, 115% of tax receipts. And here's the critical part. Tax receipts uh, are at all time record highs. Uh, if you graphed them, they look just like all these bubble assets, except they haven't rolled over and crashed yet. Uh, but if you, we've, we've been highlighting a chart to our clients showing uh, the year-over-year -year change in federal tax receipts against a year-over-year -year change in U.S. equity market cap and against the S&P 500, tax receipts are very, very likely going to fall sharply uh, in the United States over the next uh, three to six months. And uh, if slash when they do, the U.S. government is going to have to issue more treasuries into a treasury market that is already quite unsettled, as we've seen. Um, it's already dysfunctioning. Mortgage market's already dysfunctioning. You've already seen the mortgage market two Fridays ago go no bid for a period of time. Um, and at that point, I think the Fed is happy to keep tightening until they break the U.S. government. I don't think they're going to break the U.S. government. I think they're going to have to come back in, pivot, loosen, um, resume QE, I think eventually, I don't think that will be their first move. But I think the, just the degree, it has been one of the more fascinating dichotomies in my career. I've been doing this 27 years um, and, and, and has been this complete ignorance of the elephant in the room, which is the US fiscal and debt situation. We, we keep hearing all these policymakers come on and talk about the Volcker playbook like debt to GDP was 120% in 79. It wasn't. It was 25 to 30%. Like deficits were 6 7% of GDP. They weren't. They were one and a half to two. Uh, so that Volcker could put the U.S. economy in a recession. Oh, by the way, is a much highly, much less highly financialized economy, younger economy. Entitlements were payments were way lower. Uh, it was just an entirely different animal. And yet consensus to me, or it's certainly a big part of consensus, seems to be, well, don't worry. The Fed can show their 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 inflation credentials again, put the economy into a recession, and it'll be just like Volcker. It's not going to be just like Volcker, because if they put the economy in a recession, the last four recessions saw debt to GDP or excuse me, deficits as a percent of GDP rise by a thousand basis points in the COVID crisis, which I think is a special case. Throw that up. 800 basis points, 500 basis points, 300 basis points, three prior recessions to that. So let's just take the middle case, 500 basis points. You're talking about 500 basis points on $22 trillion economy. There's a trillion one in extra treasury issuance. Basically, immediately over the next short run that would have to be issued as receipts fall and as counter cyclical payments rise in a recession, there's the, you would you would unless the Fed came back in with sizable QE because oh by the way the Fed's supposed to be selling Treasuries alongside that increase in Treasury issuance the U.S. is still going to be running a trillion two deficit and foreigners with the dollar where it is I don't know if people saw the TIC report last week they're selling Treasuries the Japanese are selling Treasury the dollar's too strong so who's the buyer and the answer is is it's either the Fed if they don't want rates to rise or in a recession or if they want to let rates rise in a recession, like they do in, in an emerging market economy with the balance of payments problems, then that's what the U.S. is going to have. If the Fed stands aside, we're going to see a recession with rates flat to up, treasury rates flat to up in the United States, which when we're this indebted is not very good for, for, for a recession. So to me, 
that's the Fed's worst nightmare. I don't think they want to get to that point where you have a recession with rates rising. I think there is very little chance. I think we've been saying that they're going to be done. Uh, they're going to have to pivot by the end of 3Q. We've been saying that for, I think, a couple of months now. And after the last two weeks, I would take way under on the end of 3Q22 when the Fed starts to pivot, whether that's a pause, whether that's well, however that looks, that pivot looks. But there's just what you're seeing in the credit markets, whether you look at the treasury market, the mortgage market, the high yield market, um, foreign sovereign markets, the Bank of Japan, European, they're all having the same problem. We're seeing you know, at the sovereign level problems. We're seeing the sovereign debt crisis, the, the bursting sovereign debt bubble we've been talking about forever. It's playing out right now. And I think that's going to force them to pivot much sooner than, than most people think. Okay, and I want to give you credit for having been talking about the risk of a global sovereign debt crisis for a long time. Um, so I'm sure it's not the kind of thing you want to be right about, but I want to give you credit. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, it's it's one of these things where you sort of look at the math and you just go, it is what it is. Right. All right. Well, so you've you've walked us through some compelling math here, which basically says, look, if if, if rates continue going up, and in tandem, uh, if the economy continues slowing, especially in such a way that it's really impacting tax receipts, um, that a lot of this kind of spending that's baked in the cake already, um, it, it just becomes really hard to, uh, you know, to continue um, without having to, uh, you know, either borrow at much higher rates, um, which just exacerbates the situation, or with the Fed stepping back in as kind of the buyer of last resort here. Um, so there's a number of questions that come, come out of that. Um, you just said that, you, you answered a number of mine, but you, you said you, you think that the Fed probably stops by the end of Q3 or sooner. Like you said, you, you take the under on that, which is kind of interesting because we don't, we don't have you know, that much time between now and then. And the Fed is still talking really aggressively. Um, and of course, inflation is still, headline CPI, headline CPI is still really hot right now. Right. Um, so, you know, this is the proverbial rock in the hard place, right? So let's assume for a moment that inflation doesn't moderate. And, and I think there are a number of, of reasons to expect that it will going forward from here, but let's say that inflation remains, you know, closer to where it is now for longer than folks want. Does the fed pivot into that? You know, can it, can it, if, if it's if it's backed into the corner and it's got to pick either I got to start letting you know debts default here uh, or slowing the economy a lot more with a higher uh, cost of capital or we got to let inflation rage hotter longer than we want do you think the Fed's going to pick the latter I think they have to I don't think they have a choice I mean it the, uh, the, the, the dirty little secret is the only way the Fed was able to step back to even try to tighten is because of inflation. They need inflation to run hotter for longer. The pre policy prescription for pretty much every instance of debt to GDP being this high in a twin deficit nation is significantly negative real interest rates for an extended period of time. And that's they did it for a compressed period of time and they weren't negative enough. Right. So we, we had 12 percent, 11 percent nominal GDP growth in 2021 with uh, at the end of the year, 8 percent CPI. And we saw the U.S. debt to GDP come into the year at 2021 at 129 percent and the year at 120, 122 percent. Great. They delevered by 7 percent because bondholders got screwed on a real basis because inflation was running eight and yields weren't. Um, the challenge is that you need to run that those numbers. I think you got to get the 70 to 80 percent of debt to GDP. So, you know, 122 to 80 is 42. We need six more years of that rate of deleveraging, right? We delevered by you know six, you know, 42 points, seven percent from 129 to 122 took those numbers, right? So I'm just linearly running it. Maybe even you give yourself a benefit of the doubt. We we need to do it non-linearly, right? To say, okay. 7% deleveraging of the debt to GDP per year to where the Fed can raise rates without blowing up the system, uh, it's just a normalized policy without blowing up the system, uh, needs 12% nominal GDP for five years uh, with rates at two and inflation at eight. And the problem is, is if you tell people that ahead of time, who's the who's the sucker at the card table is going to hold bonds under that scenario? The answer is nobody. They're going to sell them all to the Fed. And so 
that's where I think we're still in this part of the game where there's this, the feds, people are still looking at what the feds saying credulously. They're not looking at where they are, which is the only way they were able to even back away from markets is because inflation was running so hot. Now there, I, I do think you'll probably see some uh, deflationary headlines over the next two, three months, right? Whether you're looking at uh, home, you know, home prices with inventories building, you're looking at retail inventories. Obviously, there's fire sales going on. You're starting to see inventories build across the economy. I think you're going to see some inflation. At the same time, sorry, you mean deflation, right? Excuse me, deflation. I think you're going to see some deflationary impulses. At the same time. I'm not sure energy prices are going to move down a whole lot for both geopolitical reasons, peak cheap energy reasons. I think commodity prices aren't going to move down as much as they would like. Maybe it's a little bit sequentially, like they have already do some some commodities, uh, but I don't think as much as as they need them to. Um, and so then they're really stuck in this rock or a hard place point. They they and I, I think the only choice they really have, and 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 I think critically tax receipts are going to move with inflation. You're already starting to see it. Tax receipts were down double digits in May, year over year. It's a noisy data series, so I don't want to get carried away with it. I would bet pretty good money they're going to be down big again in June. They'll probably be flat in July because the year ago comps really easy. Because if you remember two years ago, we moved all the April tax receipts into July when we deferred the tax tax collections in the COVID Mm -hmm. year. But tax receipts, I think, are going to be terrible for the next two, three months. And so the problem with that is that your 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 deflation, yeah, the deflation is coming down. The ability for the Fed to back away is coming down. But at the same time, your Treasury supply is going to have to go up. You know, unless Treasury sort of runs down the Treasury General account, right? They've got sort of this checking account that they've got some money in. You know, five or six hundred billion dollars, I think the number is right now. Right, they can fill in some gaps, but it's finite. And and so you're getting to this point where. It's it's decision time. They're, they are going to be cornered from the standpoint, do we, the question you just posed, do they loosen into, an, in a, into a spike in a still elevated inflation or do they keep tightening? And if they keep tightening, you know, it's only on the other side going to make the amount they have to print to basically save the system from collapse even greater. It's going to be like COVID again, where they're doing, you know, 600 billion a week or something to basically keep the treasury market functioning. I don't know if that's the right number or not. I've not done the math on that, but it's going to be some number where we're all like, wow, that's a exactly. huge amount of QE. So, but that decision point I think is coming by the end of 3Q22 at the latest. All right. Um, well, uh, if you're correct, we're not going to have all that long to wait to see, you know, the next chapter of this story. Let's assume for a moment that they do this. Okay. Um, uh, you, you talked about some of the challenges on the financial side uh, in terms of, um, you know, what bondholders might do and, and stuff like that. But let's, let's just talk, let's make it super, you know, brass tacks practical, right? You've, you've got a populace. We've had this large and growing wealth gap for a couple of decades in this country. Um, we got a lot of people now that these, you know, stimulus funds that they received during the pandemic are gone and they're really beginning to struggle. Right. And, uh, and, and everybody is feeling the impact of, you know, eight plus percent CPI. Um, so if, if the fed pivots, stops tightening and potentially goes back to easing again, um, you know, that's going to be pouring gasoline back on the inflation problem. Like, like how long can we exist with that? Like, how long before, I asked this question a fair amount, but, but I'm really asking now, like, how long before the pitchforks and torches come out? At what point is the breaking point not a financial markets one, but it's a social one where people just say, we can't deal with this anymore? Yeah, it's, it, it's a tough question to answer. I mean, I think well, let me ask you this. Is it, is it something that keeps you up? Like, are, are you worried about it or is, are there things you worry about more than that? There's, a, there's other things I worry about more than that. Um, but, but it, you know, it, that is a function, I think, of where you live, where, you know, those types of those types of questions. I, I think. Um, I mean, I think the populism has already really started. Like, I think I think 
Obama was the first populist president, right? He was hope and change. And then he sort of brought in a bunch of Wall Street guys and it was nothing different. He was Clinton part two, uh, effectively. And then, you know, that wasn't enough. So then we got sort of in, in the same year, two really more, two bigger shocks, right? We had Brexit and we had Trump. Um, and they were sort of bigger shocks. And even then, it, I don't know that, I, I think when we go back in history or when, when, when once the history books are finally written, I should say, I think Trump's going to go down as the guy who finally basically highlighted some of the lunacy of the system as it was structured. You know, we're borrowing money from China to build weapons to face down China or our supply chains are beholden to China. Our military is beholden to China in terms of a lot of critical components. Uh, our economy is, um, you know, we're, 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 we're defending the Germans from Russia while the Germans are buying Russian gas, as Trump famously pointed out on, on yeah. camera, right? Some of these. So, but even then, we're we're sort of back to a system guy with with Biden. You know, I really don't know the right way to answer the the the, the, the populism thing. I don't know what's going to, um, you know, what the sort of snapping point, tipping point could be. I suppose it could be anything. I mean, I. Quite frankly, I think we're heading towards some version of UBI. Uh, you're already seeing it in England where they're talking about handing out, I think, 300, 350, 326 pound uh, checks to people a couple times this year to a third of the population to help them with living costs. Um, yeah. Well, let, let's let's pull that thread for a minute here. And I, and I, I appreciate you just sort of entertaining this with me because it's, it's somewhat theoretical, but it, it does seem to be where we're headed, right? So um, let's say we go to UBI, right? Um, it, it's not solving the problem, right? In other words, you know, we, what's, what's nefarious about the situation that we're in as a society is as people begin to fall below the waterline, right, and become financially desperate, they want stimulus, right? Hey, I got to put food on the table tonight, right? Like, please, government, give me something to make it through here, right? But, but that's just adding more of the problem. Right. right. Um, and it can't last forever. Right. If the government could print an infinite amount of money forever and everybody would be prosperous. Well, we've been doing that since Roman times. Right. So um, let's say we switch to UBI here. What, what does that do to the story here? Does that just accelerate us to some point where the currency just gets inflated away to nothing? Or how, how long can we make it last on that? I, I think it gets very nonlinear at that point because now you're talking about UBI. I don't think the currency, I, I think the currency collapses. I think the currency is collapsing against energy, against food, against, yeah, against right, real hard assets. Yeah. Real hard assets. It, it, you know, so I, I, I collapse is a strong word, but depreciating significantly. Um, and the challenge there is this bond market, the, the, the size of the bond market, the size of the debt outstanding. And if we were in a system where it was basically purely equity based um, rather than debt based, it'd be a different story. But the debt makes it very uh, nefarious in that um, you got to find someone to hold all that debt. Or if we were low debt, we could get away with it. Um, and that's part of the Part of my point earlier with Volcker, 25% debt to GDP, he could take rates of 15, and it's going to hurt, a couple recessions, a lot of people lose their jobs, blah, 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 a lot of private bankruptcies, who cares? The U.S. government is strong. Um, they were never a threat. He raises, they, they, they can't raise rates to five before tax receipts are going to plummet. Counter cyclical payments are going to skyrocket in the, in the resulting recession. The deficit to GDP is going to blow out. The U.S. government is not going to be able to cover their interest and interest-like expenses, which you know, I call the true interest expense of entitlement pay goes plus treasury spending. They're not going to be able to cover it out of tax receipts, which means they either default or the Fed prints a difference. It's sort of the same. It's the governmental version of UBI. So you go to some sort of UBI system for political stability, you're speeding up inflation. You're going to make the inflation run hotter. Uh, you're going to put more pressure on the bond market because nobody wants to be the sucker holding uh, a three, four percent coupon bond, a six percent coupon mortgage when inflation is running, running eight and now going to run hotter with UBI. So now mortgage mortgages go to eight, nine, ten. Who's who? <laughs> number one, housing market goes down. So tax receipts go down further. You just can see very quickly it gets not when I say nonlinear, it gets you're basically going to put in a position where the Fed's balance sheet's got to go, you know, 
9 trillion, 10 trillion, 20 trillion, 40 trillion, right. very fast. And inflation goes 8, 10, 20, 50, 80, you know, very fast. Now, by the way, that's the way it has to go. Um, we go two years at 80% inflation, that the GDP is going to be at, I don't know, 20, 30%. Fed can take rates to 15, 20, 30 percent for a year. They won't break the U.S. government. They'll break everything else, but they won't break that. I will happily buy Treasury bonds at 15, 20, 30 percent. And then they restart the whole cycle. And you know what? 40 years of a bond bull market, bull, you know, bond bulls, thank you for your donation and your service to the country. We appreciate it. You lost most of your purchasing power in a short period of time uh, on a real basis. You got paid every dime you were owed. And that's that's how that's how this is going to go. The, the, the path is the interesting part, right? I mean, even, even in Weimar, Germany, and I'm not saying we're going to hyperinflate, but in Weimar, Germany, I, I don't think that's the base case. But in Weimar, Germany, there were multiple times as the currency went from zero to a trillion against gold, right, collapsed to, into nothingness. There were four or five different times in, in four or five years where the Reichsbank pivoted. It was the Havenstein pivot. And people were selling gold to buy Reichsmarks. It's the same thing we're watching now. Again, I, I don't think we're going to hyperinflate like that, but it's the same dynamic of because the debt is so big, the deficits are so big, there's really only one way out of this is you have to have significantly negative real interest rates for a sustained period of time, get that the GDP down from which the central bank can raise rates without blowing up the system. Otherwise, you're going to get what we have here this year, which is hey, the 60 portfolio, 60, 40 portfolio of stocks, bonds is down double digits on both legs. This has never happened before. It's like, well, of course it is. 120% debt to GDP, 7% deficits, and you're tightening. That's what's going to happen. You're going to collapse the system. All right. Um, and I think we can largely expect the status quo to do whatever it can to keep the system intact. Um, so and, yeah, I, and I, I think that's inflating. That's why I say that latter. At the end of the day, right. when push comes to shove, they're, they're going to inflate print the money. Yeah. So uh, following your logic here again, and I'm going to come back to my question just in a slightly different way here, uh, and then I promise I'll leave it. <laughs> um, but if we go the inflation route that you mapped out, um, presumably as the Fed is you know pumping tons of liquidity in the system here, uh, asset prices will go back up again. Uh, so it'll quote unquote kind of rescue the markets. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get some additional economic growth out of that. But I mean, I think the past couple of years have shown us that we can shove a lot of stimulus into the system and not get a lot of GDP growth uh, for it. So I'd say that's a little debatable. Um, but, you know, even if asset prices go up, um, uh, they are hyper concentrated at this point in the hands of a minority of Americans, right? So unless we have like a really substantial UBI, um, I, I just don't know how the average household keeps up with the increase in cost of living that goes along with all those asset prices here. And I, 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 I mean, do you sort of see in that scenario that we have like half or more of the country that's literally just living off of checks from the government? I think eventually, probably. I mean, I, I think there's things they can do. I think they're already teeing them up a bit, right? When you hear ten thousand dollars in student loan forgiveness per person, that's that's um, you know, yeah, a lot of those student loan payments have been suspended, but suspended is different than forgiven. You know, forgiven means it's gone, and you can now spend on something on the other side. Right. Um, I, I I think that's being teed up for a reason. I think look, if I was if I was in Joe Biden and the Democrats' position, it's which is terrible. Well, first thing I would do would be resign. But if I couldn't resign, um, then what I would do if I was a career politician, I would, I would, yeah, forgive student loans. Why not? It's, 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 it's stimulus. It's popular. It, it actually addresses. It's popular um, with those with loans. I think that there's a, you know, you open sort of a bit of a Pandora's box. Yeah. Uh, if you do do it, because it's so preferential. It's preferential, but it's preferential to a generation, by the way, that, you know, to your point of, you know, the boomers have 70 trillion in gross assets. Well, I guess it's 55 trillion now, but 55 trillion in gross assets, 25 trillion net worth. They've got all the money. And this younger generation is looking at it going, how am I ever going to get a house, a foothold in this ownership economy, the economy? 
this I think goes a long that a measure like that would go a long way in in doing it. But I, I you know, it, it, there's ultimately you get to this point: the bondholders win or the bondholders lose. And once you it, and and that's how it always is in any cycle. And if you expand the cycle time after time with bailouts, central bank stimulus, the things we've done. Uh, if you don't allow the defaults to happen, as we've repeatedly done, then the debt gets so big that it's no longer a choice the bondholders win or the bondholders lose. Now it's the bondholders lose by inflation or the bondholders lose by default. That's right. it. It, it, it's, it's the classic von Mises quote, right? It's exa exactly. Destruction of the currency or, or walking away from it. And we're there. Um, we're there. And and. So it, there's no easy, and that's why I say the first thing I would do is I was a politician is I'd resign because. It's a no win situation. <laughs> that's exactly it. I mean, there's like, why? I mean, if, if, if you want to be a politician over this, I. So, you, so start to interrupt you, let, let, let me ask this question, which has really flummoxed me. Um, why do you think Jay Powell signed back on again? I <laughs> need a perfect opportunity to kind of slink out the back door. I, 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 I don't know. Um, who knows? Uh, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. Dogma. I mean, it, the connections. I mean, he's rich enough. He doesn't need the, the headache, right? Um, right. I, 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 I I'll know. tell you the, 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 the theory that I came up with, which I think you would disagree with, given what I've heard you say, is he may really, you know, the only reason I could think of it is, hey, look, he 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 knows how bad things are, and um, he doesn't want to be seen by history as a guy that was just one of a string of of Fed chairs just running the train off the, the tracks. And he's serious about wrapping the the Volcker mantle around him, and he's going to be the guy to do whatever it takes. Uh, but I think you would say, doesn't matter. You know, he's he's it's a lost game at this point. He's he's literally just signing up to lose. If he thinks he can do that, then then we should all be in cash uh, because it's not going to work. He's going to blow up the stock market. He's going to blow up the bond market. He's going to blow up global sovereigns. He's going to blow up everything until he either cries uncle um, or he or stands aside. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, he stands aside and lets lets the U.S. government default on on their obligations. And and by the way, after. You know, the European Union does the same and Japan does the same, et cetera. You basically, you know, you know, so now it, it's interesting when you spin it, when, when I when I say it like that, when you hear him saying things like there are things that could happen that could change the international status of the dollar uh, in the global financial system, whatever he said last week, which had me scratching my head for a Fed chair to say that. Um, maybe maybe he maybe this is part of a grand plan. I've consistently been naive to think that they understand things better than they do. Maybe this is one of those times that 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 they actually do. I just I don't know. OK, um, l l let me ask you this, if you don't mind. Um, I make you Luke Roman emperor of America tomorrow. Um, what would you do? Would you just let the natural forces of deflation run their way and Yes, it would be mega painful, uh, and all the bad debts, you know, would default, um, and and we'd have a couple of really bad years. But then the dust would settle, the sun would still shine, and we could come back out and kind of rebuild things from a, a smarter baseline. Um, that's one thing, one one option. The other is something else. What, what would you do? Good gosh. <laughs> um. I, th I think it would probably have to be like something done, I guess, back in ancient Greece times or whatever, where they, where they, they, they burned all the debtor sticks or whatever. Right. So um, like a true Jubilee, a like true just jubilee. blow it up. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's the only politically palatable option at this time. Um, I would probably do that combined with a massive domestic fiscal stimulus uh, package that 
incentive, basically introduced industrial, reintroduced industrial policy a la the Cold War back to the U.S. So we're going to do debt forgiveness for all student loans. Boom. Uh, but, you know, you attach a condition to it. You cannot file for unemployment for the next five years if you uh, if, if, if you agree to the forgiveness. Right. You attach a con And then on the other hand, and then other other I don't know, other unsecured debt treasuries, et cetera. I mean, mortgages, I think you, you, there, there's, you don't, you, you can't give up secured debt remains there. So it's the unsecured stuff, student loans, um, you know, uh, mortgages, credit card, et cetera, debts. credit card. I probably implement yield curve control immediately that would allow everyone to refinance right away. Right. So boom, the fed's going to buy the entire bond market basically at whatever two, uh, and, and, you know, short rates are zero short rates are a quarter, whatever. There's a little spread there the banks can make. And on the other hand, I turn around and I, I reintroduce industrial policy. I'm going to run a $5 trillion deficit this year financed by the Fed. And I'm going to do that for the next five years. And I am going to uh, spend, I'm not going to spend $50 billion on semiconductor infrastructure. I'm going to spend, and maybe $5 trillion is not the right number, but I'm just being sort of hyperbolic. But whatever. I'm going to spend a trillion dollars on uh semiconductor infrastructure yeah forget it this whole you, you, taiwan thing is insane we're bringing it all back yeah. all of it now we're bringing everything back and we're going to run the deficit to do it the fed's going to finance all of it they're going to print the money inflation is going to be 50 percent per year for the next five years unemployment is going to zero wages are going to go up 60 percent a year for the next five years you're going to get a rebalance of working class versus whatever. You're going to get a definancialization, a rebalancing. Bondholders get absolutely waylaid. You had 40 years. You know what? Your turn in this banking machine. Um, and then at the end of that period of time, we have a rebuilt. I mean, the infrastructure of this country is, I mean, inexcusable for, for, for the richest country right. in the world. Right. There's so much low hanging fruit. Um, some sort of package like that where you could, yeah, labor rates are going to go through the roof, but that's the only way you're going to get labor. I always hear this discussion. Well, oh, we can't reindustrialize because the labor's not there. Pay them. Pay them. It's it's like Char Charlie Munger says, you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. You pay guys that you know are laying asphalt 200 grand a year. I, sh I guarantee you, you there'll be plenty of people to do it. You There will be no labor shortages if you're paying labor enough money to make a, a, a living. They can't right now. And so you're short labor. There's a bid ask spread. And the solution is not what the Fed's trying to do now, which is, oh, well, let's just crash the economy. That's, you know, to your earlier point, austerity is how you get revolutions. You know, you know, you get political change with inflation if you manage it right. You you go to austerity, you get revolutions. So it's not the right move. So that's what I if I was emperor. Huge industrial policy financed by deficits with and, and Fed yield curve control combined with a policy of student loan forgiveness. If you say I'm not going to file for unemployment for the next five or ten years, uh, and if I do, the loans get put back on me or something like that. So they can't just offload the loan and then sort of you know you know not not work in, in the productive economy. So extreme, yes. Would it work? Yeah. Would it be inflationary? Yes. Would bondholders like it? No. Do I care? Uh, but, we, no. but we would end up with a, a much less financialized system that was much more based on productivity and our vulnerability to, you know, these thousand mile supply chains and actors that we don't necessarily know how much we can trust, you know, is, is way less than it is. It checks, it checks, like, yeah, it definancializes, it, it, it shrinks the wealth gap, it uh, increases productivity, it, it increases in, uh, domestic and national security. Um, it just checks a whole lot of boxes. Yeah. De um, de decreases the, as you said, I think the, the wealth gap, right? And then the bondholders, yep. you know, get, yep. get right-sized here in this model. All yep. right, well, look, I, I, I appreciate you fielding this, folks. I did not prepare Luke that I was going to drop that question on him. So he was he, he was very kind to, to do that in real time. <laughs> um, I, 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 I would probably be more simple in my approach as emperor, but I think I would be a lot less popular than you. So I, <laughs> I was trying to I, keep I, my head attached to my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, uh, look, so that we've been talking a lot about what is likely to happen in, in the coming 
I don't know, you know, a couple of years, five, 10, you know, time frame maybe in terms of, uh, or oh, the pivot would come a lot sooner, but, but in terms of, you know, going full UBI and all that type of stuff, that that's probably still measured in years down the road. I, I, I want to ask you, Luke, uh, more about kind of surviving the next 12 months. Um, but real quick, I do just want to observe, you know, I, we've had a couple interviews now since Wealthion's been around and uh, I'm detecting from you a maybe a stronger sense of concern about all this, meaning there was a lot of this that you were warning about, but it was still kind of on the, the the whiteboard. It was a little more academic. It feels like you're now seeing some of this stuff actually happen. You're nodding as I'm saying this, but are you are you are you truly a bit more concerned because this timeline is now kind of really beginning to unfold here? Yes, and also because policymakers are acting dogmatically or, or worse. Um, you know, there's the, the famous quote in the big short where, where <laughs> I think it's Steve Eisman goes and meets with Ken Lewis, the CEO of Bank of America, and they they can't figure out what he's doing in mortgages. And they think there's some big strategy. He's laying off the risk and he gets done. He goes, Oh my God, he's dumb. Hmm. It's, there's nothing more than that. He's dumb. And to me, that's the scary thing with some of our policymakers. I, I, I think some of it is that they're just dumb uh, or they, they're so dogmatic that it doesn't make sense what they're doing. And so you can see things now playing out. We've been saying to our clients uh, for really the last uh, three months, and this is the scariest macro setup I've seen in my 27 years in this business and in, 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 in finance um, because it is so unique in the setup, we've never had debt that, you know, we've never had debt this high. We've never had derivatives this high. We've never had these Western social entitlements go cash flow negative the way they are. Um, we've, we're, we've never had peak cheap energy like this where you're trying to move a society en masse from a higher energy return on an energy investment and the more to lower ones. ones. Yeah. Um, it's never been done in history before. Historically, cultures that try to do that, they collapse, they go away. Um, the geopolitical situation, uh, the the supply chains and the complexity of supply chains, the deindustrialization of the U.S. specifically, the West uh, parts of the West more broadly that has occurred, um, all of these things they are just this toxic stew of of factors, and yeah, I think. In hindsight, when you go back to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, I think that was really, I think first COVID really accelerated things. And now I think this Russian um, invasion uh, has, has, has accelerated it further, both because the inflation, you can't, you can't print over energy. You know, when right. I see the European Union doing what they're doing, the UK doing what they're doing, these places are literally running the Weimar Germany playbook, the economic plan, which was, oops, we lost the Ruhr Valley coal stores to France as war reparations. Don't worry about energy, just print over the difference. And it's literally what we're seeing the Germans and the, and the English and the, the EU serious people advocate. We don't need Russian energy. We'll just, we'll just go without, we'll just ride our bikes. We'll just print money. We'll just send checks to people. Like that, that's not a serious plan. That's that's it boggles my mind. And so when I see these things, I go, they're 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 marching the EU down the path of hyperinflation. Well, right. if you have a currency like the EU move toward or the, like the euro move toward, if it collapses, like the all bets are off. I mean, with debt where it is, people seem to think, well, I'll, it'll be safe. It'll be good here in America. It might be relatively good, but. People forget we don't really make anything in here anymore. It's all over. The supply chains are stretched out. We saw what happened when supply chains break down. Um, it just takes a couple parts and the car doesn't get built. The computer doesn't get built. So uh, uh, to me, I think why I'm really getting more concerned is the leadership and the response to the leadership. Um, I mean, to me, it was obvious what Putin was going to do. I mean, he had to have known that we were going to sanction him. We've been doing it to everybody. So then when he basically weaponizes gas uh, to support the ruble, 
to me, it's stunning that, I mean, it seems like plan B was, was on the, in the West was, was like, okay, let's kick all the Russian tennis players out of Wimbledon and send another $40 billion <laughs> to the Ukraine. And so I think that's why uh, I'm so frustrated and so uh, fr- uh, frightened, maybe a bit of a strong word, but so concerned because of the lack of strategy, the lack of understanding of making connections that I'm seeing uh, in the West in particular around these issues. I, I It just either they it's like, oh, my God, they're dumb or they're so dogmatic about their view of the world that they don't see what's happening. And it kind of ties back to my initial point that there is no discussion. There's just this blind discussion. We'll just fight inflation like Volcker. You don't have the balance sheet to fight inflation like Volcker. You don't have the deficit to fight inflation. You don't have the demographics. You don't have the economy. You don't have any of it. And yet you think you can because why? Because you're standing under the same flag. That's not how it works. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there was, so you and I have been longtime students of the importance of energy, um, both to functioning economies, uh, but also just our way of life. And, you know, when you, when you look at armed conflict throughout history, it's largely always been a story of resources and all resources to, in one extent or another, you know, are, are based in, in energy, the energy it costs to extract them. Um, so one of the, the more seminal books um, written about the energy story is The Long Emergency by James Kunstler. Um, he wrote another book called Too Much Magical Thinking. And that's exactly what I hear you railing about right here, Luke, right, is um, when, when people don't really appreciate or even understand the big predicaments they face, uh, it's tempting just to sort of, in the interim, turn to magical thinking Right and and you know proclaim all the ways in which it's not really a problem, um, and those those then die as reality really begins to arrive in force, and then you're you're you, what results is many fewer options than you had uh, would have had if you had taken action earlier. So, anyways, I totally share I share and I appreciate you you sharing your uh, you know concerns here about the the captains of the the ships of state in which we are all in right now. Um, okay, so uh, getting back to kind of, okay, in the immediate term then, so we have what I believe, looking through your eyes, is sort of this destiny with, with inflation uh, down the road. But we right now very well may be looking at disinflation for the rest of the year and maybe even tipping into deflation in certain areas, depending upon how long the central bankers tighten and, and, and how much they tighten by. Um, so I do want to I do want to sort of ask you the question I want to ask you is what odds are you placing right now on us going into a recession and how serious of a recession uh, do you think it may be? And I want to just preface this by you, you mentioned the EU. Um, I was really shocked by this. This just came out a couple hours ago. I don't know if you saw it, but um, story from Reuters: European Central Bank President Christine Lagarde warned that the risk of an abrupt correction on Europe's financial and housing markets is severe. And you know this is coming from the same folks that said, hey, when it gets serious, you have to lie. Um, the fact that they're now all of a sudden waving this red flag on like, hey, you know, might get a lot more painful than it's been already in both the financial markets and in housing. So they're even trying to kind of tell people to assume the crash position here a little bit. So anyways, back to the question. What odds do you think we have of entering recession here and how bad do you think it could get? I think in Europe, it's 100%. Our interview with Luke will continue over in part two, which will be released on this channel tomorrow as soon as we're finished editing it. To be notified when it comes out, subscribe to this channel if you haven't already by clicking on the subscribe button below as well as the little bell icon right next to it. And be sure to hit the like button too while you're down there. Last, if the challenging macro outlook Luke has detailed in this interview has you feeling a little vulnerable about the prospects for your wealth, then consider scheduling a free, no strings attached portfolio review by a financial advisor who can help manage your wealth, keeping in mind the trends and risks that Luke has mentioned here. Just go to Wealthion.com and we'll help set one up for you. Okay, I'll see you next over in part two of our interview with Luke Groman. Thank you.